show up, and I thought I could give some kind of 15, 20 minute talk and a heterodox micro session on Friday afternoon. It wasn't until it was pointed out to me that, in fact, he put me up for a plenary session. I mean, I would have shown up today and still would have thought that I was talking tomorrow afternoon had this had been pointed out to me. So I'm grateful to Bruce Baby uh, on this plenary session. Now, the topic of this session is a, um, a long-standing topic for people like myself. So we talk about microeconomics, and we're talking broadly about people who do Strapian stuff, or both Keynesian, social economics, Marxian, who deal with something other than a financial sector and some kind of aggregate. Do um, something below, below the surface. So I've been at conferences, in places where people talk about, for example, post keynesian economics is macro. And they actually say to my face when I'm uh, sitting here, and I say, well, you know, how about micro? Oh, you're an exception for that. <laughs> this is just bloody nonsense. So this is a long-standing issue of, in a sense, the role of microeconomics and heterodox economics. Uh, and it's not that I'm trying to say that all heterodox economics is uh, microeconomics. In fact, as we go through the talk, we the talk, what you'll find out is that I would prefer not to have a division between micro and macro. We're just economists, and we do different kinds of things dealing with the economy as a whole. So this is, in a sense, a talk coming from a long period of time when micro, people did micro simply were not counted. An example of where they're not counted, that there's a rather large conference, a post keynesian conference in early November in Berlin. And they are explicitly anti-micro. It's only a macro conference. I've written to them about it. And the response is, we just do my macro, that's it. Now, in fact, if you actually tried to do this in the United States, that wouldn't work. It's hardly sectarian. Uh, but these are the kind of things that it says drive this particular talk. Now, hopefully I can do something right here. That didn't work. So that was slightly part of the presentation. The rest of it is that the micro foundations are macroeconomics. Great debate. We love this debate. Except for the fact that the only people who actually want to engage in it are Tahi, Joe, and myself as a way to get some kind of credibility to get people to talk about micro. We don't do it because we really think there's a real debate out there. We do it so we can talk about micro. Because otherwise, who would want to put on a couple of sessions on heterodox theory of the business enterprise or how we carry out our analysis of cartels or what happens in trading? You know, these aren't interesting topics to many economists, many heterodox economists, so we have to dress it up. And of course, there's a lot of discussion about this micro foundation of macroeconomics, but it's a very strange discussion. First of all, some of the discussion revolves around that, in a sense, in the notion that the only microeconomics out there is mainstream micro. And hence, the question is whether heterodox macroeconomics is compatible with it. Well, one would have thought that's a few of the that's, that's a very strange notion to come across, but um, that's one of them. The other one is that heterodox macroeconomics is completely separate from any type of micro economics and hence has no need of any micro foundation, or there's no such thing as heterodox microeconomics and heterodox economics, especially those, those case variant, is all macro. Uh, I find this one particularly uh, disappointing because the people who say this are 20 years my junior and were never part of the original set of post Keynesians in birth from the 1970s like myself in which there was no distinction between micro and macro. And certainly, there was a micro, because the only way that post keynesian economics actually got itself organized in the United States was by a cotton-picking microeconomist named Alfred Eichner, who 
statement more or less that comes out of people's memory. Uh, so the point is, is that that one is, is particularly. Uh, but what's the problem? The problem is that all three comments are in fact completely false, um, invalid, or whatever you want to say. Uh, first of all, heterodox macroeconomics of any substantive nature is completely distinct from mainstream macroeconomics. And that cannot be reduced to micro, in mainstream microeconomics. What I mean by completely distinct, we'll just talk about one small little thing that makes it completely distinct. Non neutrality of money. Anytime you have the state in a turbulent approach, when the state creates money, money is not neutral. So, whatever you want to talk about in terms of macroeconomics or heterodox macroeconomics, it is completely distinct from the mainstream. So, I'm not sure why anybody would care about what's happening in mainstream debate when they want to reduce macro to micro, because heterodox macro has nothing to do with that. Another one is that mainstream microeconomics is completely incoherent. <coughs> not that it's just not in the real world. That it in fact cannot say anything that it wants to say. Uh, the example I like to give my students is that, oh, Gee whiz, they can't get aggregate demand curves at the level of the market on their own branch. If you can't do that, then there is no, in a sense, coherency to mainstream microeconomics. The irony of it is that, except for my institution, because I teach the poor, <laughs> virtually every heterodox institution, we all reserve for this one at this honorable institution, teaches Neoclassical micro as microeconomics. They don't teach any heterodox stuff. The virtually all heterodox economists in the United States come out knowing neoclassical micro as microeconomics. Um, one would, should start questioning whether places like UMass or Utah are actually heterodox departments when they teach mainstream micro as the only micro. <clears throat> they actually teach it as if there has some meaning to it. I mean, I teach the damn thing. I tell this has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. <laughs> but you should learn the thing. I mean, you go out and read little things about people with hairy feet and go off on quests with finding rays which make them invisible, and that has, and you believe that that has some kind of coherency. I know some people here might actually think it's true, but that's, that's another issue. But the point is that we learn all kinds of incoherent things because we need to know about them. And one of them is the classical micro. Can't be, can't be an economist without actually knowing the nature of it and its incoherency. Uh, but to actually teach it, it has any meaning. Uh, give me a break. Okay. Then there's heterodox microeconomics, which is theoretically coherent, more or less, but still, still in the works, uh, which is completely distinct from mainstream microeconomics. So if you want to have a micro foundations debate in heterodox economics, then at least use the right microeconomics to have the debate with as opposed to being classical microeconomics. But the final thing is that, at least from my perspective, is that the economy is an interdependent, disaggregated whole, which means there's no separation between micro and macro, that there's no validity to that kind of notion. We're dealing with the economy as a whole. And what I'll be doing in the rest of the talk is, in a sense, Addressing this issue, while there will be lots of kind of models or equations up on the board, you get lost in trying to figure out precisely what they mean. Look, um, you're going to miss the forest because you're looking for the trees. What these show, because I can't go through them all because nobody actually teaches this stuff very much, so you're not familiar with it, is the fact that the economy as a whole, no matter what component that you're dealing with, at quote the micro level, it's all interdependent. So there can never be, in a sense, a problem um, or the issue of trying to add up individual components to get to the aggregate, <coughs> because that's not simply possible. So what we want to be looking for as I go through this talk is the fact that we live, that our theory is an interdependent theory. So no matter what component you're dealing with, you're affecting someplace other than the economy, and hence uh, we cannot separate the <coughs> from the macro. So, with that, well, let's look at the economy as a whole. This stuff is going to look terrible. Telling you. That's why they do those logs here, you can't read. Okay. Now, first of all, I'll just briefly mention uh, the four categories. If you go to 
talk about developing the economy as a whole, then we have to talk about things like the production schema, how particular goods and services are produced at the individual level. Then we, uh, so we have to talk about that. We have to talk about circular production, so we have an economy in which um, when we have circular production, the, let's just say that everything is produced and reproduced within the economy. And we'll talk a little bit about what we mean here. Then we want to talk about circular production, non-produced inputs, and scarce inputs. Clearly, if we want to have circular production and no non-produced inputs, then the issue of scarcity doesn't exist. And we we'll talk briefly about fixed investment goods, resource reserves, and surplus. It's all going to be very sketchy, <coughs> but um, let us um, look at the economy as a whole. Now, this, this economy consists of lots of uh, sectors or industries. Uh, the first one can be uh, and industries that deal with the basic goods sector. And then there's M minus N for the surplus goods sector. So we have a whole bunch of sectors out there. The only reason I emphasize this is that there's a guy named Tom Powell who likes to make a claim that somehow um, heterodox post Keynesians have very underdeveloped models. You should have more sectors in your models, things like that, make them more complex. Well, this only has about five or six. I'm up to M at this point. And then there's a fairly large number who want to make it one. So in that sense, this notion that somehow uh, veterans kind of don't have an overly complex bizarre with the economy is completely nonsense. We do. Uh, so, that's, so that's the first thing. Now, the second thing you want to look at is that in this particular setup, this is a, a basic non-basic, surplus good being non-basic. This basically means, um, in this context, that um, you have circular production for those basic goods. Non-basics um, get added on to it, absorbing all the output, extra output from the basic sector. The only surplus in the economy happens to be the surplus goods. And this has a whole bunch of ramifications, one of them being that any production of a particular surplus good is unconstrained. Anybody? No input output stuff. This was all shown back in the 1950s. Um, so there's no constraint on the uh, production of any particular surplus. We come back to this particular point. Um, and, and the point is, that's what the model is set up to be like. Um, and this means that the issue of scarcity has no meaning in this model. Again, we'll come back to it. So when people talk about somehow relative scarcity, <coughs> about driving heterodox modeling, the answer is no. It's never been there. Anytime you have circular production. Uh, and that means that with no scarcity, then not only when we have supply goods, we have to get no scarce factor inputs. Uh, we can't have prices relative, relative scarcity, things like that. Again, we'll, we'll come back to that. Now, the second point is that
constructed diamonds. We can go on. In fact, the only reason that we can use whales is that we actually have technology to be able to use them. If we didn't have it, then we couldn't use them. And we actually can forbid certain kinds of technology if we so want it. We can turn resources into non-resources. So all resources are socially constructed. But if they're socially constructed, then they cannot be considered as given, not produced, naturally given. So that's the first one. This comes from the institution. And the interesting thing about it is that people will say, yeah, we're at Heterodox Economist. Do they actually bother to read any institutional literature on anything? The answer is, well, well, we read some Bellman, but we don't bother to read much else. This comes out of people who work in Texas. And it's a very important part of institutional literature that resources are socially constructed. Now, how about labor? Well, if labor is not a socially constructed entity, then I suggest, if you believe that labor is simply naturally given property, Somehow, the properties are given, which makes them different. So now we have a division of labor, but it's not constructed. We all think that, and I suggest you retire now and take your partners out to some kind of interesting holiday because everything that you do is totally irrelevant. Of course, everything is socially constructed, but if you really want to believe in socially constructed labor, then just come and teach at an ex polytechnic in the UK. I can tell you right now, they are directed, what I call you, it was also there, that they are directed to train or construct people to fit into the workforce, and that's it. Now, it's creeping into the older universities, but if you really want to see socially constructed um, labor force, then teach at an ex <coughs>
work fellow managers. He started with the state. I'm old enough to remember playing around with these kind of um, let's get models, for example. Lots of fun. We can solve these things. And was the state ever there? No. You know, it took me a while, but you know, I ended up going to UMKC and Randy Ray and Stephanie Kelton sit there and slap me around and say, no, the actually the state is important because it creates money from a Charles perspective, which I had already accepted back in 1977 when I went to change the to see money. I just never followed up and followed through, through with it. So it took me a couple of three decades to come to my senses. But the point is the state has to be there. Now, I know there's some tie into it, I get upset with this because of monetary theory of production. It doesn't have a state. They start with banks, which there is no state. I have no idea what that, in fact, means. I mean, I can start with hairy little animals, hairy little hobbits, and talk about a whole bunch of things. doesn't mean it has any bearing in the real world. When you start with banks with no state, money with no state, that just has no meaning whatsoever in the world. So you start with it. You start with the state, you start with charge of theory of money. There's no exception in this. Now, what you want to do with it may be a different issue. But there's no exception in this where you start. Let's first go now.
So remember, I'm a microeconomist, the way most people think about it. And my starting point is the economy as a whole. What you don't find are macroeconomists who say, gee whiz, we'll start with the economy as a whole. But do they start with something that's disaggregated, that you can then actually look at particular sectors or particular areas? Um, the answer is no. This is very strange. Uh, very, very strange. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go through this. I just want to indicate that we have we can come up with a fairly complex model of the economy. The model here is that there's also quantitative equations here, mathematical equations, which you then can manipulate as opposed to the scheme. Uh, but, so we have it set up now. We need to kind of keep that in mind. There's financial assets, liabilities, all kinds of stuff in there. But what we have to have is a set of agencies. Somehow people work work with these kinds of frameworks, and they actually have no agency whatsoever. That is, those that actually make decisions that make the system run. So what kind of agency can we look at? Well, the agency that I want to deal with um, is the enterprise, state, household, market government, that be cartels, employer associations, price leadership, that is, how do you control markets, and trade unions, the other side of it. All of these are designed to do this by an agency within the framework itself. What I mean by this is, well, I'll just step back. The definition of an acting person. Acting person comes out of a social, social economics literature. The acting person is a social constructed entity, but it's not an individual that you would think of as an individual in a technological sense. Um, the acting individual can't be the actual business enterprise. So it's a way to capture the activities within the enterprise, all essentially worked out by individuals who are in the enterprise, but we call the enterprise itself <coughs> the acting person. We go to the well. Fortunately, in the United States, this becomes very concrete when we have to find that corporations are people. And some corporations get to have religious um, viewpoints which they can impose upon their employees. Supreme Court decisions three days ago. I just want to let you know that if you think you have it bad here, just come to my part of the world, and you can have it even worse. Um, so, uh, so what do we mean by this? So, is that these organizations make decisions about particular variables in the model of the economy. That's what they do. So wage rates. Wage rates are just not, well, let's assume a numeraire, era, some would do in their pure labor model. Right? But I wouldn't talk about you. I wasn't sure the problem. The point is that these are all decisions. You have the various acting organizations, institutions make decisions about these particular variables. And it's only with their decision can the system actually run. You notice that these decisions. Well, much more pervasive and interdependent than simply just simply uh, set a wage rate. I mean, first thing you do when you want to set a wage rate, you have a, uh, a conflict between employer associations and trade unions. Well, this is clearly not an individualistic activity. It's clearly an interdependent one. Uh, so that's simply one to indicate that all these decisions are not something which are independent from now, given that the, how we can actually uh, have decisions in the economy, we can then say that this is what our model of the economy looks like. Whole set of input output structures there, a uh, whole bunch of social, uh, social accounting agents where the outputs go, where the, uh, where the who, who gets them, uh, with stock flow consistency in here. We identify both stocks and flows. We, we produce investment goods. Which is a flow that you have stocks as, as part of your K matrix. K matrix. So we identify both stocks and flows, where they go. This is stock flow consistency and social accounting all rolled into one. Um, the stock flow stuff that you get out of Buffalo Boring is very complicated to look at. You can do it through equations a lot better than they can do it through their matrices. Uh, 
Well, we need an agency to equation. But so, but you can do this. So this stuff flow consistent, social accounting consistent framework. Basically, Mary um, Kletsky with um, the kind of stock flow stuff that Mark Devore wants to do. Okay. Now, that even gets worse because what we want to do is that, well, if people are making decisions about certain things, then we have to get into the price model of the economy, setting prices, then we need to do the output employment model of the economy. You don't have to worry about where these things kind of come from. It's not together, but what's important? Well, what's important is that the production, any production, the surplus is our final demand. Production of any one of these goods affects the entire economy. So how can you say that there's some kind of a distinction between micro and macro when an enterprise decides to order more investment goods than what it does do sets off a whole chain of events that means that the entire basic sector gets called into play to produce the goods and services necessary to produce the investment goods. We're not talking about a bunch of separate sectors here. We're talking about a completely interdependent economy. And of course, the same thing with setting prices. You set a price, it has ramifications throughout the economy as well. We won't even go into even more ramifications is that if we introduce uh, the social accounting, it means that markups are constrained throughout the economy because they have to somehow be relevant to the purchase of investment goods. So what we start having is the non non basics and strategy instead becoming quasi basics. So now they start constraining what wage rates can be and what profit markets can be. Anyway, so the economy is interdependent. That's the whole point I'm just trying to get to, whether uh, you look at it depending on the set of equations or not. Okay, now we can ask some of the particular questions. Uh, are there any constraints in this system? Any constraints whatsoever? Well, we're already, I've already stated that given our kind of um, um, production model, that there's no constraint on production of the surplus. There is no constraint. So there's no scarcity, no nothing whatsoever. Second one, say these profits and investment. If investment goods can be produced with no constraint, and they generate profits, profits are simply produced through investment goods. There is no shortage of profits if there's no shortage of investment goods. But the real question is, where do savings come from? If you can produce your investment goods out of current production, then what is savings? My argument is that savings should be dropped as a kind of analytical category. We just simply have investment, and it generates the profits to purchase. Now, of course, you can get profits from financial assets from the state, but that's a, that's a different issue. So, I would argue that you can simply eliminate savings by about investment profits. But we also know that government expenditures, which generate current production, will generate profits for the business sector. But what is that's not a current production? Again, where do we need savings? We don't need it whatsoever at all. And finally, wage rates, uh, wages, consumption goods, and profits. First of all, consumption goods and, and investment goods are not trade off with each other in the nature of the production system. Uh, and consumption goods simply generate the kind of wage rates and wages you need to purchase them. So it's very easy. You produce the consumption goods, then you generate the wages and uh, wage rates to follow. So there can never be a activity around the price mechanism. Now remember the price mechanism is set up to um, deal with exchange, uh, prices and production, that is uh, between initially between a bar exchange, between two, two individuals and simply exchange things. You have a price system to emerge out of that. Now, if you want to believe that a barter system somehow exists in the from the 20th century, 21st century capitalism, then that's fine. We don't actually have to deal with that. We can simply 
saying that there is no price mechanism, but what do we want to mean by there's no price mechanism? Well, price mechanism requires certain kind of function relations between prices and quantities. That's what a price mechanism, mechanism does. And of course, those items that are on the quantity side must be relatively scarce items. But we already eliminated the notion of scarcity. So that actually doesn't. And then we have to talk about questions of price and quantity. Are they connected in some systematic way that you can actually draw a demand curve? Remember, the demand curve is not something hypothetical, not something which is random. It's a systematic set of motions between price and quantity. And I can tell you right now, there is actually no evidence whatsoever for that particular unit. We're not even going to get into Tony Lawson company attacking this stuff. We'll just talk about it on crass empiricism. <laughs> uh, that there's no relationship. Anytime you're going to start holding prices constant for six months to a year to two years, and output varies. There is no relationship between price and quantity. There's a relationship between wage rates and employment. Now, if anybody here is post Keynesian, they would have said no because Keynes said no. It's not actually a good answer, but that would give you the right kind of pathway. Again, as wage rates remain relatively stable for long periods of time, you have variations of economic activity, then there is no connection. There is no Extraordinarily large amount of research being done in Europe on the issue of wage stability. Um, and it's very interesting, but wages are relatively stable. Once you have stability, then you don't have a connection. Interest rates say you can invest in are they connected? The answer is, well, how low? We've known that since 1939 with Dr. Ricardo's research group when they did their research. Interest rates play very little role. And in fact, if you actually look at the literature, what you'll find is that the interest rates are there, but about four billion other things are also included in evaluating how you make investment decisions. And interest rates are very minor. I'm not saying that uh, they're not looked at, but they're very minor. But of course, what you can't get that kind of setup is a function relationship between interest rates and investment. So if you don't have any of this, then there's no price mechanism. So we can just simply kiss price mechanisms at bottom. Now, this brings us back to what does actually organize economic activity? And I'm just going to state quite bluntly, it's effective demand or production of surplus. That's what we've been stating all along. All of economic activity is coordinated to effective demand or production of surplus. What's so interesting about this? Well, first of all, prices don't play any role in the coordination of economic activity. It took me 30 years to make this statement. Since I come from the Commission, you have to talk about prices, and I spent a lot.